to what you said. If if there is a reverence that is had for the indigenous people or community that inhabited that area, there shouldn't be a divide on changing the mascot. It should just be a no brainer. Um, if you have reverence, then you understand how harmful it can possibly be. Excuse me, possibly be. And one of the th you know one of the the things that can be done, a couple of the things actually that can be done, is you know. Does the school acknowledge the land that it's sitting on? Do you have a land acknowledgement? Have you done that? Is that something you've looked into? I mean, that that's a brilliant way to honor indigenous people and Mohican nation who were in those lands. And, you know, teaching actual history, not, you know, five sentences on what Thanksgiving was or, you know, what might've happened before that, but actually teaching truth honors the indigenous community. Yeah, well, thank you for, for offering that. And I can tell you that uh, since this topic has come up, I think there's a lot of people in this community that have done a lot of research and uh, we, we've learned a lot just by uh, researching the Native American tribes and their opinion on this issue. So thanks again for presenting. Absolutely, thank you. I had a question too, Heather. Thank you, thank, as Bart said, thank you uh, for joining us tonight. And this is just my ignorance. Like, so the, we we are on the land that that your ancestors were on. Is that correct? Particularly Mohican Nation, but I will just point out: no matter where you're standing in the United States, you're on Indian. It's, it's hard. It's hard for us to hear. I don't, but so so I guess I was I was wondering then how did uh, are there any people here still? that we uh, could speak with? Like in the area? Yeah, in our area. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know that. I, I don't have like, sure, yeah, yeah. a beacon that points yeah, me in the direction right. of where Mohicans are living. Um, but I mean, there, I mean, if you can speak to any indigenous person and they're gonna tell you that you know, it's just not appropriate. And we do have, you know, we do a lot of work out East, even though we're based in Wisconsin, we do do a lot of work out East because that's our homelands and that's what we're looking to preserve and protect. So, um, you know, we do have an office in Williamstown, Massachusetts um, at Williams College. Um, and, you know, and I oversee that office that's there, but I mean, we are, you know, open for conversation when in there, whenever anybody wants to learn about who we are or, you know, what we've accomplished or, you know, anything like that. We're, we're, abs we're excited to talk about our history and, you know, who we were. So we're open to conversation anytime. That's great. Yeah, Williams College isn't far. So how, how did it, uh, you, when did the people here leave and where did they go? So our removal, we were in various different places, we were forced out of the Mahikanatek River Valley, which you know, Hudson River Valley. Uh, we were forced out of there um, pretty early on, right after colonization started. And then we were forced out of Stockbridge, Massachusetts, after we helped win the American Revolution. And then we were forced out of New Stockbridge. And then we were forced out of White River, Indiana, and then Kakana, Wisconsin, and then Stockbridge, Wisconsin. And that's how we ended up where we're at today. So we have quite the removal history. I could go into more detail, but then I would feel like I was uh, giving you guys a lecture, and I don't want to do that. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I get, I get, what I was getting at is how, how did you know how did folks that lived here not be here anymore, and and how did that uh, happen? So I think yeah, it was all through you. forced removals, forced removals, oh. land sessions, these, and then you had uh, the Removal Act that was signed in 1830 by Andrew Jackson which a lot of people think only affected the Southern tribes, but it affected the Northern tribes as well. Terrific, uh, thank you for that information. Mm -hmm. Any other board Anyone else? questions? Um, thank you, Heather, for being willing to um, speak with all of us tonight. Absolutely, my pleasure. And if there are any other questions that you think of later or weren't comfortable asking this evening um tara has my contact information and i'm totally fine with you giving that okay 
Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Anything else, Tom? Did, did you talk about, um, or are there ideas about next steps, or are there other, are there other uh, areas we need to cover, or anything we don't, we haven't done that we should do or should do again? Any, anybody have any opinion on, on that? Um, it, yeah, we definitely want to continue the um, education and just finding information that um, community members are asking us to find. Um, it was suggested that maybe we make a question and answer document so that community members, if they have a question, uh, they would be able to go on to our um, spot that we kind of have on our webpage and um, they would be able to find it and any of the questions that I, the couple that I answered tonight, as well as any of the other questions that we, um, will, we can find in the survey or as people speak um, from now and you know going forward, we can add them to our Q&A and we can um, kind of have all of the answers in one spot so that you know people aren't trying to go searching but kind of make a document and um, made me think of the document we created, the frequently asked questions for our uh, opening the school back up, mm -hmm. you know, that type of a thing where we just have the questions that are coming in and then we answer it and we can add links so that people can follow to where, you know, there's whatever. Um, but we do, again, I just want to reiterate that we, on our webpage, we have um, all of the survey results for the public to view. We have the forum is back up there um, for the public, as well as any of the letters that we've received. Um, they're all on there. And then anything that we have gotten from NCAI, as well as the Stockbridge Weekly um, Tribe, we put, that is all on there as well so that the community can see, because we do, we just want to be as transparent as possible and just have everything available to everybody. Sure. Um, I would just, just like to offer up this suggestion for the committee to think about um, about possibly doing some focus groups with some stakeholders on both sides of the fence on this issue um, to see with the motivation to see if there's any common ground between the two camps and, and make that a starting point to see if there's any common ground that we can agree on with this issue and, and make that a stepping stone moving forward to come to some solution uh, that both sides could possibly live with that at the same time honors the Native American tribal community. I know um, on the survey, we asked everyone um, if they would be willing to be part of a committee and um, their for or against is, is part of that. So we can definitely look through it as a committee and see and pull from both. Um, I think that that's, you know, a great idea to, you know, hear and continue to work with both sides. Thank you, Bart. Well, I know there is a mountain of information there. And I'm still going through uh, pages and pages of, of that information. Uh, obviously, uh, this, this is important to the community. And uh, but I also want to thank Tara. I want to thank the committee. This has been a pretty big job that most committees don't <laughs> get uh, 
assigned to, so to have public forums and to surveys and all that. So it was a, it's a ton of work and it's going to continue, I think, because we sounds like we're still interested in, in learning. I know I learned tonight just from Heather and, and I know some of the ideas that we, we heard and or I read were, are there, are there representatives of a group that would advocate to keep the mascot? I, I don't know if that's something that we could find or certainly Bart's idea about the groups and I did see a number of people that did say they would be interested in working on that to try to find some consensus so that's but I do want to thank thank you Tara uh, you did a great job a professional respective respectful job uh, on the uh, on the virtual public meet and, and uh, you, you folks have done terrific we're gathering the information to inform us okay. as we uh, come to come to a decision. Okay. Randy, you gave us more to read. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the cultural love, love book that we're reading, reading uh, the one, one chapter, chapter um, that uh, I forget which chapter it was, but the, uh, the author commented on how when he became a, uh, when he was a young administrator, he went into a, a school district where uh, there was a group of uh, large minority students that were, he felt not being challenged or pushed, pushed to a higher level. And uh, he came in and started a summer school program for these students. He started a mentoring program and other support groups to assist these students throughout the year. Um, and it was, it was a collaboration and collective effort by the whole school to challenge these students to, to take courses that they normally wouldn't have thought about. And, uh, and he had some resistance from the community, but in the end, it all worked out. The students were challenged. They performed exceedingly well with the support mechanisms that was put in place. Um, so with that, um, and I, I think about what we do in our school, and we do an amazing job of getting support, um, but some thought would be to maybe give the board more some information of how we're taking our students and challenging them. And what is the mechanism by which we challenge them to take courses out of their comfort zone? And uh, it'd be nice to hear how we do that. Mm -hmm. and I, I know over the years we've heard parts of some of that process, but if we could maybe think a little bit more about here, some more of that. Mm -hmm. I think you get a better understanding of how we function. Yeah, well, would love to <laughs> bring some teachers in and, and share firsthand what, what we're doing in, in that regard and how we continue to um, remove the gates, so to speak, uh, to, to access to, to coursework. Um, and there's been a lot of work done already, and there's you know, still some work to do in, in that regard. But, um, but I, you know, so I definitely we'll, we'll get on that. We, we actually had a conversation with our links team today, a little bit. Uh, close to this, we're just talking about the summer and how, what can we do to help kids this summer? That was kind of an open-ended question, you know, um, you know, besides the traditional extra help, but what other ways um, that we can help kids, you know, um, th you know, this summer, whether it's everything from helping them learn how to change a tire, that was my idea, uh, just little camps to more in-depth um, learning experiences and things like that. So we can bring that for summer term back to life this year. So, uh, but no, we'll be more than happy to Talk about that. That's why we're here. <laughs> um, the governance core, which of course is a little bit more nuts and boltsy uh, than Louvelle's book there, The Culture of Love. But I don't know if anybody had any thoughts on, on chapter two. This is again a lot of 
nuts and bolts kind of thing there. Um, if we had any takeaways from that. Talked about, you know, heavy things like systems thinking and strategic focus and all that kind of stuff. But. I'll, I'll just add just um, that I think everybody knows it here, you know, when, and again, this is hats off and it's, and it's hat day here at CA. So the hats off to the board um, because in, in, in reality, when you become a board member, you're, you, you just, um, in, in our case, you have seven or eight now new spouses, you know, in, in the scheme of things. And so how as a board, do you, um, you know, have those sometimes difficult conversations in, in, in a way and, and let and be able to listen and, and, and converse and, and come to consensus on whatever that topic might be. And, you know, and, and this board, I think does a great job of that, um, you know, through and through. And, um, you know, and I think part of that, that whole idea of deep learning is not only learning as, as, in a sense like Art just mentioned, you know, learning about what's going on in the schools, but learning from each other as well. And how do we uh, continue that, that, um, that process as a governance um, group here? Uh, and again, I think you guys model that well, you know, from my years of experience working with boards um, in that regard. But that was just kind of one takeaway um, was, was that idea that, you know, um, continue to learn from each other. And, and, um, and, and if there's concerns or, or questions to, to get it out there instead of letting things fester, you know, so it's almost like relationship one-on-one, I guess. <laughs> so, um, we all sometimes forget like our spouses remind us of on occasion, uh, <laughs> sometimes. So, um, but anyway, but I thought it was, it's a, it's a, it's a, this chapter is probably kind of like the, the, the nuts and bolts of what a, a board does, you know, I, on, in the scheme of things here. The next chapter, by the way, is what the superintendent does. So, uh, so anyway, more than happy to hear feedback on that chapter. <laughs> we go forward. So I appreciate your indulgence with those. Okay, leadership team reports, your update. So uh, the first is just on uh, this week uh, marks one year uh, that CA and many schools across the state uh, closed uh, or, or went into a different version of learning uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, several weeks ago, we had some teachers and staff come to us. We're we gonna do anything. We're we gonna have some type of, you know, no, nobody wants to call it even. Uh, just to kind of, so acknowledgement, you know, of, of being at this for a year. Uh, so we, we thought that was a good idea. We asked for, for um, ideas and assistance. Uh, it, this is hard because it, it, it's affected, you know, everybody differently. Uh, you know, in the last year, you know, we've all either lost a family member mm -hmm. or we know somebody who lost a family member or, you know, in, in, in that regard. And it's just, you know, it's, it's horrible uh, in, in that regard. Um, you know, but, but at the same time, we also want to just acknowledge that we're here for each other and, and we want to honor our, our commitment to each other and to our students and our students to us. Uh, and so we kind of put together a, a daily uh, events, if you will, and we put that out there and, uh, you know, and, and such like that. And it, it, it's been going pretty well. I think yesterday's sidewalk chalk was, you know, for everybody who went out there, I think there was a lot of pauses and um, wow, you know, what the kids were writing on the sidewalk. Unfortunately, mother nature washed it away today. So mm -hmm. uh, they won't be there to see, but we did take pictures and video and we're gonna put something together. I think Mrs. Miller is on that one uh, in, in that. So, um, so I think it's, you know, again, it's uh, just to recognize uh, we've, we've all been through a lot. Uh, it's, it is hard on everybody. It is difficult, um, but, but also recognize that there, there's, there have been successes, you know, and there has been, um, you know, some positives, believe it or not, out of all this. Um, and just to, to say, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing okay. And, and again, I'll, I'll put us up to anybody. I, I really will uh, of how we're doing here uh, as a school district. And that is just uh, hats off to the 229 people who are here every day, the adults, but also the kids, you know, and their families, because it's, it's tough on mom and dad or grandma who are home with their kids who are still remote, uh, you know, and, and such. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a lifetime event for all of us. Uh, and, and hopefully it will, um, not be as much of a lifetime event soon, uh, you know, in our country in, in that regard. So, uh, so again, just, I just want to acknowledge and, and, and say thank you to everybody uh, for, for just, you know, putting up with it, you know, and, and, and being there for each mm -hmm. other and, and being there uh, for your families first. And, and then the kids that we work with every day, 
um, and your colleagues. It, it's just, um, yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic we're going to come out of here stronger out of this, you know, come out of the other end, so to speak, stronger as a school community. And I think our kids are going to, you know, be stronger because of it as well um, in a lot of ways. And, and for those who are still struggling, we're going to be there for them. You know, and, and that's a constant, we've always had that conversation, but it's even more so. What are we going to do for people who are still struggling, you know, as we move forward? Um, you know, I know that's a, a, a very important focus for the school board, and rightly so, it should be. Uh, and we're going to continue to figure out um, just to make sure everybody is, is okay, you know, and is, is doing okay. Uh, and, and we're there for them. So uh, tomorrow's blue and white, <laughs> by the way, as we finish well, up tomorrow. Thank you, Randy. I, I, I do agree it's important. I mean, Thank the staff. Um, to, it, it, it's it's amazing. amazing. It's been a year. And uh, all the things that have changed and that we do differently and some things that we will continue to do differently and other things may be changing a little bit as we proceed with the vaccinations. But I think as you state, it is important to acknowledge what's happened and, and how, how it's impacted all of us and, and help the kids understand what's happened too, because it is a lifetime. So it'll always, always remember, remember this upheaval, like when you have your junior honor society have their induction uh, six months late uh, after, after they would have if it weren't for this. All of those things are impacted. I appreciate, I know this is, you know, people, uh, paying attention to this with, with the kids and decide, yeah, we, we, we'll, we would like to see what, what the kids wrote. Uh, mm -hmm. I, that, that's, that's good. But thanks everybody for just paying attention to that. And the kids pay attention. It's been a lot of, a lot of loss in a year. And it, it, yeah, it, it's, it seems like we all, we, you know, tongue in cheek, it seems like five years ago, you know, a yeah. year ago. And, yeah. In fact, like a picture popped up in my feed. I took a picture when we were here that weekend trying to figure it all out. The administrative team were in the district office. Of course, we're, you know, you can't do that now, but if you're on the district office, you know, pizza boxes everywhere. It's like the um, troll room of like, you know, mm -hmm. like that. I mean, it was so long ago, I missed a proper red hair. I mean, it was just, you know, uh, oh, it's, it's, it, it just seemed like it was five or 10 years ago at that point. So I could pick on it. But um, um, we didn't know what we didn't know. We didn't know. We I didn't know back then. I'm thinking, well, we'll do this for a couple of weeks, and then it'll go back the way it was. And it just yeah, hasn't yeah. happened. Yes. So, but um, but again, just thank you to everybody, leadership team, for, for trying to figure it all out and putting it in place, and the, the teachers for for constantly letting us know how we can make it better, um, and you know, and going forward, you know, for next year. And I don't, we don't know what next year is going to look like, but we're going to make sure it's it's better than it is today. That's all I can ask. Mm -hmm can ask for so uh, on the same kind of line we uh, we try to find out how things are going with our with our parents and our and our students so we did put out a survey to, to the remote only parents so the kids who've been remote not the ones who kind of bop in and out um, it wasn't you know we didn't get a huge you know got a decent feedback um, and I share that with the board I believe um, you know in there and um, just kind of share a couple things there which of course I don't have opened up Oh, there it is. Um, so just a couple of the questions we asked, um, you know, what would, one of the questions we asked was what would trigger you to, to have your kid come back permanently into our schools? And, and the top answers, and there was, and they could choose more than one, um, was 43% of the respondents said when all staff are vaccinated. Okay, and, and thankfully we're almost there. I mean, you know, for those who want it, you know, they're, they're pretty, and, and again, a shout out to Green County. Uh, I just want to say that real quick for, for kind of getting us away game you know in, in the region in the state and in the country uh you know for that one so again shout out to, to, to penny and, and um mr groden and everybody there and, and the health department for doing that for us uh the, the second uh one was when the cdc and doh say schools are safe 38 percent said that was would be a factor um I'll, I'll, i'm not going to comment on that one uh, i mean, it's a, it's, i understand it but just we know that we sometimes get conflicting reports from them uh, and then the 19% said no mask breaks, uh, less in-person days, and, and, and students are vaccinated, 16%. Um, you know, again, when that happened, I'm not sure, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll go forward there. So uh, this is kind of interesting um, on that. We did ask them also, is, rem if, is remote learning working for you? And if it was available next year, and again, I don't know if it will be available, 
in the sense would the state um, mandate it be offered or not? I don't know because they haven't made that decision yet. Um, but if it was offered in some form or fashion, would you um, be interested in having your kids still stay remote? And 44% said maybe, 29% said yes, and 12% said no. So um, you can take that both ways because if you then look at the comments, I didn't, they were all positive, which I no surprises there. Uh, our, our remote teachers and our dynamic teachers have done a phenomenal job uh, with that. And you can see those in the comments there, uh, whether it's our elementary, you know, remote teachers who, you know, are just have remote each day. Um, they're, they're knocking it out of the park. You know, they're just doing fantastic stuff. Um, and, it, and it's a really interesting mix of our teachers, you know, veterans and newer ones. So it's, it's kind of cool uh, that they stepped up on that. And the middle school, high school teachers are, um, if they're not falling asleep by six o'clock every night, then they're, uh, they, I don't know, uh, they're very in shape, I guess, because they, I would be exhausted every day because they're, you know, they're doing the live in-person thing, at all, you know, simultaneously dynamic in most of their classes. So, um, and that, that's just tiring, hard work, uh, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. on that. Uh, but you can see that the parents are appreciative of it uh, and um, are, you know, happy with the results at this point, you know, at least the ones who responded, you know, it's almost like a catch 22. We, we might be too good to the remote. We, they may not, you know, we won't get them back <laughs> there, but I think they all want to come back. I think mm -hmm. our teachers certainly want to see them all back. And I think at the elementary, we're like 86, 87% of kids in K-4s are back in person, you know, and a little bit, a little bit more remote folks in the middle school, high school. Uh, it kind of puts us at a district about an 80% average. So 80% um, are in person, 20% are remote in, in the district. So, um, but I don't know if anybody, any comments on that? Comment. Yep. Um, I've heard and also read that some of the high schoolers are just checking out the remote partners. Mm -hmm. What can we do to help them so they don't feel like they're checked out. And I don't know if it's necessarily from our staff point of view or if it's just the students themselves. Mm -hmm. yep. Doesn't feel part of our community, you know, our school community. Right. So I don't know what we can do to help alleviate that. So, so the question is, is we have remote students who are not engaging. Yes. Um, and that's the, a million dollar question that every school is asking themselves right now. You know, I just, I mean, you know, so it's not unique to CA. That's the, the, um, I know we're doing visits uh, across the board. In fact, I was talking with, you know, I know, we're talking about high school, but the elementary, Mrs. Miller yesterday went to 33 houses yesterday and visited all of her remote students. Um, so just going to be as good as Mr. Nugent, knowing everybody lives in town uh, with that. So, and I know Dr. Mercer has, and the counselors have done home visits. You know, it's just one example of what they're doing uh, to, to try to get the kids engaged, uh, you know, and just constantly reaching out, um, trying to leverage when we can the county, you know, as much as we can, but that's, they're, they're overwhelmed, you know, and, as well um, in that. So it's, it's, it's a constant struggle. It's a constant conversation of, um, you know, carrots and, you know, trying just to get them to, engage, be there, do the work, um, you know, um, and show promise. Because again, there's another piece here, it, it, you know, there's no readings exams. Here's the time kids, you know, to, get, to do your work and get credit and you're good to go to graduation. I mean, you know, let's put it as what it is, you know, this is, um, you know, uh, with that. So it's, uh, you know, again, hats off to our counseling staff and to the administrators and teachers who are, um, becoming in, in a good way, just, you know, badgering those, you know, and they say, I'm trying to think of a better word, but, you know, just constantly on those kids. But it's, we're talking about it as superintendents. I know the principal's talking about it regionally. Teachers are, you know, what can we do, you know, to help, besides getting them here, you know, that's always the, the you know, and, and, and I know Mrs. Castle's done a great job of getting a lot of the uh, special ed students back who at first weren't here, you know, they were remote and just, just, you know, having those heart to heart conversation with the parents that they're, they're really better off being here in person, you know, for, for most, you know, again, there's a few, there's some kids that are doing well, you know, and are thriving in some ways because they just, they, they're not in there. They're not here, which was triggering some other negative stuff. So, um, but for a lot of kids, they, they, you know, we know that they're here, you know, proximity helps when it comes to helping kids, you know, complete things and do stuff. So, um, and it's just, yeah, and if somebody comes up with that example, you know, we'll all be, you know, copying it and that. Yep. 
I, I don't know much about that. Uh, I can just be loud. loud. Are, are oh, you okay? Come on, yeah. So, um, yeah. I, what's the rationale for the, if you like the random remote days that we're doing for everybody? Like, I mean, I'm not complaining right. about it. I just want to know because I don't, I know that. My son does better when he's at school <laughs> yeah. and we work. So it's hard. I mean, he's on and he's doing his work, but it just seems like he's done. Like he has these um, 84 minute periods and they're like classes are not that long because it's a half a day. Right. But I feel like, you know, for math particularly, because it's a double year for him. Mm -hmm. I just wondered why we yep. decided to do that. Well, early on, they were to practice mm -hmm. being remote in the fall, you know, because we want to be ready, you know, in case we had to, again, we didn't know, we didn't know in August, you know, we were all anticipating, you know, I think if we all put a dollar down, we'd all say we'd have been closed by Columbus Day, you know, and if we were honest with ourselves. So, um, so that was what it was. I think it just kind of carried over. The two that we just had were on the, on the elementary parent well, conference. That, yeah, for the secondary, um, you know, we, we talked with the administrative and teacher leaders. Sometimes logistically it was, be honest with you, it was, let's just have another half remote day. Mm -hmm. um, we got some staff development in, in, in the afternoon, um, you know, in that regard. I don't think we're going to have any more scheduled for the remainder of the year at this point, um, unless there's some, you know, yeah, maybe outside fine. reason we need to do it, you know, if there's like a testing day or something mm -hmm. like that. So, um, but yeah, it was mainly at the beginning just to, so we'd have some practice, right. you, you know, because mm -hmm. for a lot of the teachers, you know, that was besides doing it in the spring, which was on the fly, we had set up a new system to test, mm -hmm. test it out. And it was actually helpful because I believe we kind of tweaked the secondary schedule a little bit after we yeah. did it once or twice. <laughs> you know, I'll push back on it. So I don't anticipate any more um, this spring unless there's something coming up in that regard. So have to, like the remote days. Sometimes uh, I think it's, I hate to use the word easy, but when all your kids are remote as a teacher, you know, oh, you know, 100%. You're, right, you know what I mean? That's, that's but I understand true. too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, just, it's just like for us, because we're like, oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I get it. It's almost, yeah, if we could bring the kids here, but still, mm -hmm. I don't know how we do that. You know, the teachers could be remote. The kids, right. teachers will be home and do remote. Kids will come to school. I don't think they'd, kids would like that. So, um, and then uh, the last topic is uh, community use of facilities. And I kind of, was, um, it kind of goes with what um, Bart brought up with the, the innovation committee. And this is liaison. Um, so I actually was kind of looking for some guidance here. We're, we're, uh, I'm okay, because we kind of did it in the fall to allow groups to use our outside facilities. You know, as long as they go through the, you know, like how we're gonna, you know, socially distance, if it's like soccer or something like that. Um, I, I think I'm okay with like just people showing up and using our track after school and our tennis, you know, cause that's socially distanced anyway. Uh, the, the, the quandary I have is the inside use of facilities. Um, so I'm just kind of curious what the board may feel on that at this point. Cause, and I kind of look at it, kids and adults, uh, you know, you have kid groups like our scouts like to sometimes use our facilities and, you know, there are kids, so to speak, CA kids, but then we also have adult groups who like to come in and use our gyms for basketball, for instance, or they may, we've had conversations about opening up our fitness room, you know, as well to the community um, and have it supervised um, in that. Yeah. So I was kind of curious what your feelings are on that. And, and whatever we did inside, we would do it in a way that would not be any additional um, work for our custodial group. Let's put that out there um, right off the top. If it means more time for them, then I'm not, not going to do it. But, I'm not going to say that. I, I think <laughs> there's <laughs> anything else, especially now that we have a structure in place to manage it. And we go through the Department of Health, make sure that we're following the guidelines that they've set up, and that you have probably a use form. You know, and an attendance and a contact sheet. Yep. And then who's gonna clean up the area when it's done? So there's certain things that go along with COVID protection from that we'd want to pay attention to, I think. But opening it up, I think some, yeah, I would I would agree to move in that direction. Slowly. Put those yeah. Things in place. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot, it's a lot easier to do it outside, obviously, than, than in. Fortunately, it's March. 
<laughs> is that like a district decision or do we have to go through the county? Like report that, I was just wondering, because like but spectators and stuff, that was like kind of like curved. All over the place. Yeah, yeah but that's day. county, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, so, so, like, so if we want to open it up, let's say have Little League use our fields, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's guidance currently that we could, we'd have to abide by, you know, like um, One so many, well, or, well, that plus so many people at the event, okay. I think is more so. I think it, for that, I don't think you even need parents. That's a, a league role, parents are leagues, like okay. the league made the parent role. So, but as far as like, let's say there's a Little League game on our, and I don't know the numbers, but let's say they say only 50 people can be there. I, I think it's just a total of 50 people, whether they're nine-year-olds or their parents okay. for, for that piece of it. Um, and those are out there already. You know, Cause there's, so, yeah, I don't know how you do 50% capacity of a softball field, <laughs> how you measure that. But um, so I think there's just a number because I know that's what we're using for prom um, planning as well. You can have so many people. But we would run this all by the county, yes, before we sign on any dotted line to do this. So. I agree we should open up our, our outdoor facilities. Yeah. Um, I'm still a little weary about mm -hmm. the indoor. Yep. So I will go for outdoor. Okay. I, I was going to say the same kind of what Jamie just said. I think the outdoor is great. We should definitely move toward that. Um, people can spread out and kind of sit, you know, where they need to, and it's fresh air. But um, the concern with the indoors is if we start allowing groups of, say, you know, 30 people in, you know, then this type of a meeting should then be able to have those same amount of people sitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I just think about that. I don't think we have any besides the auditorium. There's no space. Just that's a big number. Just. Put, put it out there so okay. yeah i, know, I, you're right. I don't know what the department of health yeah. is saying right now they, they're <laughs> you know but whatever it would be mm -hmm. you know we just want to make sure that yep. that applies to you know i know okay. there's a lot of us and we make up a lot of that number as the board of ed but um. if, if, if if it pleases the board i mean our next meeting april 15th um hopefully it's really warm by then but um it's after easter break you if, you, if, I, if I could come back, or you'll have to see it ahead of time, but if I come back with, this is the, you know, what it's going to look like, but at least I think outdoors, we could, think uh, I, do I have to feel a consensus for outdoors? Okay. I thought you were suggesting we have our meeting outdoors. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe for the, for the 15th, I'll bring back an indoor, a vetted plan from the county, DOH as well. And our, our student body, like clubs and things being allowed to uh, meet in person right now. Like student council, the students that are here, are they meeting? They can, yes. Okay. Yeah, I know I know some are still doing it virtually, okay. um, but I know they can. I wanted to make sure that we're, we're affording yes. space and opportunity to our, our students before we worry about the community. Okay. Yeah, agreed, yeah. But our, our student clubs are up and, and running and uh, again, some are doing it virtually, some are doing it depending on the size of the group they're getting together and like the cafeterias or stuff like that. So then we, uh, we have a very, there's an app for that. So we use it for the clubs as well. Um, for the kids sign up, it's called e-hall pass. Uh, we'll have to have Dr. Mercer demonstrate this because I think it's pretty, pretty slick. And so it's, 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 it's also, it, the kids are there, you know, and they can cap it. So let's say we only want 20 people at this event. So if the 21st kid tries to sign up, they don't get to sign up, you know, and then at that, then we can use it God forbid, if we need to contact trace, you know, it, it's all set up. So they use it mainly for, for using the bathrooms. So, um, but it's been now expanded to be used for that. So it's a pretty cool tool. So, so okay, so I will um, put together the outdoor uh, and then for the 15th, I'll bring back um, an indoor. I think we can slowly start phasing in our community members. You know, I think you guys usually have a good plan about things and you know, just slowly start incorporating it. Okay. Good. Family first. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think okay. I'm all. I'm Michael. I just like to say thank you for the board's attention. Um, I know, I know, I know a lot, I have a lot of input, input members, members, and we've been waiting for a couple of hours. 
Yes, just give us two seconds to set up the tech, but yes. <laughs> All right. Well, in the meantime, then. It might be easier to have them go first, and we'll have the principals go after. Okay. Just... Yes, it's on. I can see it. I just see. Oh, yeah, you're, everything's on. Oh, okay. So we're set. Yep, that's mine. Thank you, Clark. Advocating for me. Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is JD Fielding. I'm a 13 year resident of the village of Kuksaki, and in our household, we have children who attend and participate in the athletics in the school. I've always supported the school's achievements, both academic and athletic, and I applaud this district on how it has handled the COVID-19 pandemic. Even my child's physician has said that Kuksaki Athens is the best that they've seen in several districts. And I do believe that we stand tall as a community and as a school district in the face of this adversity. Tonight, I am here to talk about stand in support of keeping the Kuksaki Athens Indians branding as is and as it has always been, to keep it honorable and to keep it as an opportunity to encourage further exploration, the rich indigenous history of the area and its relationship to surrounding counties and state. The idea is to educate, not eradicate. Never has anyone in this room seen this branding carried out in a disrespectful manner. Our community takes great pride in the Kuksaki Athens Indians name and to suggest otherwise <clears throat> has been a great insult to both alumni and those who have emotionally, financially supported this community's athletic and academic, academic programs. <clears throat> Prior to moving to this community, I spent two decades on the Navajo Reservation. I am the blood parent of a native child and grandchild. And the plight of native people is very close to my heart. Having immersed myself in the language, the culture, the religious practices, and the general daily life of the people living without water, without electricity, and living as the people. I still remain confident that the branding of this school is in no way appropriating a negative stereotype of any peoples, and it only stands as a badge of honor for those who work, study, play, and fight to defend it. During the virtual meeting, <laughs> there was a lot of semantics about the branding of the type of Indian figure being used in the older publications and the brochures. That takes away from the overall discussion. But I do support not using a depiction that would characterize any specific tribe or stereotype of any tribe. However, I do fully support in keeping the name and the branding that bears the current feathers image in lieu of the sometimes used headdress. That is, if something other than a name is necessary for the majority of those deciding this. We need to keep it democratic and some compromise should be made for all concerned. The idea of a focus group is, am is, is amazing. In conclusion, I remind the board and the watching alumni and the supporting members of this community that a great deal of time, energy, and financial resources goes into putting this type of branding into the renovations, recent remodels of the school, its grounds, its athletic department. But I do thank you for your time. I thank you for hearing me out and allowing me to share my thoughts on this matter. And I hope that the board takes this into consideration because the future support necessary from this community will weigh heavily on that support and that decision. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jake Caldwell. I'm an alumni. Grew up here. I was an athlete at TA, as were my parents, grandparents, distant relatives. Now I'm also a uh, resident, a parent of a student. I'm a teacher, coach of multiple varsity sports, 
and I assist with the strength and conditioning of the other varsity sports here at school. I consider myself very fortunate to be a member of the dedicated athletic staff here at CA. We are all very invested and committed to our athletic programs and to our students. Though I can't speak for all coaches, I can say that many of whom I've spoken with have expressed strong agreements with my stance on this topic of changing the mascot. I and many others in this community feel it is time to change the mascot. We need to be honest here. We don't really have a mascot anymore. We have a name. Uh, years ago, we decided to stop putting imagery on our uniforms, uh, stop having somebody run to the gym, dressed up like a, a Native American chief. And those were the right choices to make. But it's also a little sad because we as a school, we don't get to have the full experience of having a mascot. We, we just have a name and it's one that we have to be really careful about and we don't really get to celebrate the way that we would like to um, because we know that it's inappropriate and, and that it's outdated. Um, I spoke at the last meeting about why it's good that the name change is overdue. We all learn in grade school. I work right here in this building. We teach students that India is a country on the other side of the globe and that using the term Indian to describe the native people who lived here was a misnomer. It was a mistake. And our name is based on a historical mistake. And it was chosen in a time of where racism was pretty powerful. And, and that's the basis of where this current mascot name came from. We know that many national and regional organizations representing indigenous nations and people have spoke out and said that they would like the name to be changed. But I know as well as anybody that around here, we don't like outsiders telling us what to do. So I reached out to a more local representation. I contacted the Iroquois Museum that we were brought to as kids over at Howe Caverns. And I spoke with their historian, who's also a member of the local Onondaga tribe. She spoke with me for over an hour about why the use of the Indian name as a mascot is not only offensive, but inappropriate, and what, how that harms people who feel that, who, who consider themselves indigenous people today. And she would be happy to come and speak with you if you'd like me to set that up. Um, by changing this name, we can show our young people that we do listen when people talk, that we do have respect for everyone, and that we are willing to change and grow to better ourselves and our community. And I think that's an important thing to demonstrate. Um, on the plus side, on the positive side, let's think about how exciting it would be to get to choose something new, to have a mascot again, to have somebody who can get dressed up and while out at halftime of games, to have something that we can cheer and chant, put images all over our school. I think that's something we can all look forward to. And I think we can find something that better represents us as a community. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Jackson. Um, I'm a parent of a student here at CA, um, actually from the Athens community. Um, again, I wanted to uh, state as board and to the leadership of the community, wow, being able to open the school five days a week and yet also offer remote to other students who really needed that as well. That level of leadership wasn't a democratic process. It wasn't something where you took a vote and said, okay, so we had this many this, this many this, and so we're only offering this many positions of remote and this many positions because that's the vote. Um, in the same way, this mascot um, decision is not a democratic process. If a student was feeling taunted, you wouldn't say to the one who was talking to them, now what is your opinion? And therefore um, we're gonna take a vote and see whether this is, which is more popular. This isn't a popular vote. This is a group saying we are, what you're depicting is not right about us. We are offended by it. When we find out and our, our children tell us, or we tell our children, if someone you're doing to, something to another child and they say to stop, you stop. Now we have to do that too. We have to. We can't keep saying it and then not do it ourselves. So that's your only choice. 
the only thing that this board can do then is to decide on how long is it going to take. I heard some great things that Tara was talking about in terms of the fiscal responsibility and how long it would take and how it wouldn't cost anything. Those are the things that people are worried about. The things that I've also heard people worry about about memories, which I don't understand, but um, my high school is closing at the end of the school year. My memories will still be intact. I will still remember the other students that I went to school with, the events, all the different activities we did. None of that goes away. So memories, I don't see how that has anything to do with your memories don't disappear. But your memories in 25 years, when our children come back for their 25th reunion and say, man, did they hold on to that image for way too long in that name. This is embarrassing. That is a memory we don't want to give them. We need to change this because the people who are affected said stop. And when someone says stop, you don't wait, you stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having me. My name is John Cameron. I spoke at the virtual meeting on March 3rd, voiced my opinion, and thought that was significant to get my point across. But I was contacted by someone very special, and they stated that if the Kusaki Athens Indian is removed, the Favicchio family will have the monument of Tommy Favicchio removed from the football field and placed elsewhere. This struck a chord in my heart because not only was Tommy a CA Indian athlete, he was one of my best friends. And his, if his family feels this strongly about this subject, I owe it to him and them to fight as hard as I can to save our Indian. I graduated in 1989. I was active in the sports program from seventh grade until graduation. The Indian was always expressed to me as a stereotype of pride, courage, bravery, and tenacity. I was taught to bring these same principles onto the court and fields of competition. And I was to never act in a way to tarnish the Indian name I wore my jersey. The Kuksaki Indian is in no way linked to any negative stereotypes. I asked the board in the virtual meeting if they were approached by an organization or one person. I was not given that answer. I have that answer now. It's come to us in a variety of ways. It was, it was I read one thing, it was brought to the Anthony Pass. So I'm gonna go with the person that was one person who brought this up. So if one, if this whole thing was started by one person, where does it end? If a person comes and said, I'm offended by the meat in the school's menu, is the board gonna consider removing all meat from the menu because one person is offended? When does it end? <clears throat> the Indian has been the mascot of our school for decades, without issue until recently. My mother worked in the high school principal's office for decades. And never once did she ever mention to me of any parent calling in because their child was in need of counseling because our Indian hurt their feelings. Honestly, does the Indian mascot bother you to the point of losing sleep or needing counseling? Is it so much of an issue in your life to be willing to change district traditions and cost the taxpayers thousands of dollars or is it just the social justice warrior issue of me? Once decided upon, people will move on to the next issue. I hope those who oppose the Indian take the time to truly think about the reason they want to replace the mascot. It supposedly disrespects the indigenous people who once lived here. <clears throat> well, let's think about that. If this is true, and you truly believe this, shouldn't you then go home and consider forfeiting your properties back to these people? Since their lands were stolen from them, it, being stolen from them is far more disrespectful than our school district honoring an Indian with their name and likeness on a jersey. As mentioned earlier, Mr. Cowell brought up a point that the term Indian was offensive because it was used, it was created in a mistake, okay? The discovered people came here and thought they were an Indian. So they want, his one of his rationale in the, in the uh, virtual meeting was that because it was a mistake, we shouldn't use it. Well, the fact that the discoverers found America by mistake, should we just give up America and move somewhere else to get back to the Indians? The 
there's a couple points that I want to make before I leave. In 2004, when this whole issue was brought to light because of the Washington Redskins, there was a survey done by indigenous, by, by for indigenous people by the Annenberg Public Policy Center. They surveyed people, indigenous people, in the lower 48 states. The question asked was, the professional football team in Washington calls itself the Washington Redskins. As a Native American, do you find that name offensive or does it not bother you? Quote, unquote. The, real, <clears throat> the results showed 90% of those indigenous people <clears throat> stated that the use of the Redskins name was acceptable. 9% of those people found it to be offensive and 1% decided not to answer. The margin of sampling error is 2%. This was not of organizations, this was common people. As far as the survey that was done online by the district, I find it to be questionable due to the fact that you could answer these questions multiple times, answer your input multiple times. Kind of like people hiring marketing firms to get what they want to do to see in public opinion. <clears throat> there was also a case in 2001 in New York, and I'm going to destroy its name, Salamanca Central High School Warriors in Salamanca, New York, where the reservation, <clears throat> where the Allegheny Indian Reservation, the Seneca Indians, joined with the school district in. Uh, petitioning to keep the warrior name. In closing, I believe that during these most uncertain times, this board has far more, issues, more important issues to deal with than this one. I hope the interest in these board meetings remains at this level and the same amount of community input is requested and given on all matters, not just this one. I believe I've made my opinion on this issue known, but just in case, I'm 100% opposed to changing the name. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I just need to sit down because it's really emotional for me. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. This is really important. I'm here to speak to the issue of changing the mascot. Let's start by looking at the core values listed on the school district's website, which are empathy, gratitude, and taking positive action. I'm here for all of that and want to hold the district accountable to their statement. I have empathy for the situation at hand. Change is hard, but also necessary for growth. I think we can all agree that no one can tell us how to feel and that this issue is very personal for many. My goal here is to share it with those who might not understand the lived experience of a person of color in your community. According to census records, Athens has an 88% white population. So I urge the majority of the population to listen to someone outside of your experience. I'm half white, but I look brown enough for people to notice and ask me about it constantly. So I've been forced to think about cultural issues my entire life. I wanna say that this is not easy for me to come and comment publicly here. Athens has not felt like a safe space to me as a person of color. Soon after moving to Athens, I had people drive by my house and yell white power and my house was egged. I had been called racial slurs while walking down the sidewalk. I moved here because of the good school district and people had told me it was a safe community. I moved out of Athens because of the lack of safety I felt as a mixed race person. Every person of color I've spoken to in the area knows this about Athens Kaksaki, and it is an unfortunate reputation that I hope can shift with conversation and self-awareness. My background is in working with children and education, so this is really close to my heart. When I first sent my child to EJA, I was shocked by the mascot and felt like I was alone in wondering why it was still this way in this modern time, particularly in an educational setting where children are meant to feel safe learn and have respect. And this was the t-shirt I was given for my child on the last day of school. This is where my taxpayer dollars went. I've never let him wear it and I never will. 
waiting years to have this conversation on a larger scale. I didn't bring it up when I lived in town because I didn't want to be one of the only people of color advocating for change. Because again, this is not a safe space for non-white folks. And God forbid I come off as an angry brown woman. I respectfully asked around about the context for the mascot, just wanting more information. And people told me it was because of the history of indigenous people in the area. But frankly, that's a weak argument because this entire nation is built on indigenous land. So I need a better reason. I took an archeology span course and studied paleo Indian history in the local area. I read extensively about the culturally significant church quarry in Athens. So yes, I understand the pride around the history, but I don't see any indigenous community around. So why was this mascot here? It seems so out of place. For a majority white population to say, I'm an Indian is problematic. You are using cultural appropriation and calling it pride. Does any revenue go towards supporting any reservations or indigenous communities or you know, historical lessons that have been people have been displaced? Because if not, then you're benefiting from another culture. And I think this community is creative enough to come up with another more appropriate mascot. As a side note, owls are pretty incredible apex predators of the night and a symbol of wisdom. And have you seen their intimidating scowls? I don't give a what you all change the mascot to, but what I do know is this change is long overdue. Being stuck in outdated ways is not something to be proud of, but reflecting and being self-aware enough to recognize when growth is needed is something to be proud of. And what an incredible teachable moment for students. My last note is real change only happens when policies are put into place to support them. So I urge the school board to consider voting to change the mascot. One of the anchor strategies listed on the school district's website is growth mindset. Well, here's your moment to lead by example. Thank you for hearing me. Another thing I just found in the hallway was this with the mascot on it. But let's read this part. Open your mind. That's what I, all, I, I hope that we can all do here tonight. Thank you. Is everyone here? Okay. We also received emails and letters. And we'll, they're all going to be, have been or will be shared with all the board members. An email from Abby Martin regarding grade grouping. An email from Casey McCarthy regarding grade grouping. An email from Allison Phoenix regarding grade grouping. And a second email from Abby Martin regarding CA reconfiguration. And we received letters, well, emails actually. Uh, Today and yesterday, uh, an email from Mark and Patricia Spath regarding keeping the mascot, an email from Mr. Ralph Vaca regarding not keeping the mascot, an email from James Ewing regarding keeping the mascot. An email from Michelle McElroy regarding not keeping the mascot. An email from Henry Weinart regarding keeping the mascot. I hope I, I read them all very quickly. I hope I got the opinions correct. So we'll look at those and then we'll either respond the next meeting and the, on the agenda or prior. Okay, so if we go back to building highlights and department highlights. If Mrs. Miller is with us, we could talk about Fuksaki Athens. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello. Good. All muted. right. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you probably read, read, can everybody, can everybody hear me? There you go. Yes, yes, yes. 
So you so probably, probably heard all the different highlights, highlights or read them in my, my the insert that you have. One thing that wasn't in there is uh, every year we have the New York State Agricultural Literacy Week, and this is in its 17th year um, that it's held. And this year they're featuring the book Chuck's Ice Cream Wish, um, which dare, it's called dare, uh, Tales of the Dairy Godmother by Viola Butler. And this book uh, will take students on an explorative journey as they trace food um, from the plate that the students have to um, the source, which is the farmer, while also showcasing the diversity of the agricultural industry. So I'm pleased that our second grade is participating in this year's virtual event. We have many other virtual events that um, we've had this year and that we're continuing to have, um, along with planning another author visit. Um, and that our third grade is also um, having more presenters come into their program. Mrs. Fili has someone coming from uh, uh, the American School in Brasilia, and that will be taking place this week as well. So great online offerings that uh, regardless of the pandemic, I hope that these are things that are going to continue that we'd be able to have um, access to as well as moving into the 21, 22, having more in-person events and bringing back all of our assemblies in that wonderful space that you're in right now. So hopefully we'll get to use that board and it will be operable <laughs> and uh, things, things will be different, but also to continue with a lot of our virtual programming. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martino. Are you available? Yep. Okay. Am I coming in there? Yes. All right. I see you. Phew. Got a little worried. So uh, we are gearing up for the annual PTO fun run. And uh, it was a unanimous decision made by the PTO to rename the fun run in honor of Margaret Schmidt to the Margaret Schmidt Memorial 5K. Um, I think it's been a wonderful thing to do um, in her honor. The PTO has put together uh, various protocols in place for the health and safety, and uh, we're really looking forward to another successful PTO event. Um, and the uh, run will be on May. Um, in addition, I want to thank our PTO for submitting and receiving a uh, grant through the Athens Community Foundation to purchase a shade structure for the playground. Um, and it will also be dedicated um, in Margaret Schmidt's name uh, sometime in June. And she was a big advocate for getting um, some sun uh, sunshade structures out on that playground. So I'm really excited that that will be happening and uh, just a couple of ways that we can honor somebody so special like Margaret. Thank you, Mr. Martino. Mr. Proper is right across the room. Anything with the middle school? Okay, you can shout or. Yeah, there was a, there was, yeah, there was a link. Yeah. Very nice. It reminds me of Ms. Miller, the, uh, the monster that was 
being sold too. That was, I wasn't sure how much that would cost to buy, but that was cute. Dr. Mercer, the high school. All right, this is, can you hear me? Yes. It's weird, I don't know if I'm talking. I can't see myself. Um, so you guys got our good news for the month. Um, I think we've had a few things, you know, more recent things. I I'm gonna say yesterday, I spent almost the entirety of that two hour lunch block, which is very, very long, but not, you know, not, not just for the kids, um, with students out doing chalk on the sidewalks, chalking their messages, such, you know, messages of positivity, upbeat messages, just, um, and it was, despite the fact that it was a little cold, it was just a great afternoon um, seeing kids be kids you know, for a while and the middle schoolers came out and we saw some elementary kids across the way. It was, it was a very nice afternoon and the kids really, uh, they had a lot of fun. I wish it hadn't rained. Um, and then the other thing I know, Mr. Squire posted on Twitter, I posted on Twitter as well. I, the phys ed department, specifically Jackie Cashin and um, with assistance from Carl Henchy, our new aide and coach Wilkinson's daughter, who helped set up some of the weird little things in the on the gym floor? They set up a 15-hole miniature golf course. Um, I went into the gym on Tuesday on the remote day and saw just stuff all over the floor. And I was very scared that some kids had gone into the supply into the storage and had you know, we're playing some sort of prank on them. And then, you know, Coach Cashin came out to explain what they were doing and it was brilliant, um, you know, a way to utilize our space to be able to, you know, be socially distanced and not have to worry, you know, it was not aerobic exercise obviously, but um, it was a lot of fun. I went and played a, f a few rounds and, and talked to the kids. They had no idea that it was going to be happening and it just, it, it was it was so creative and such a surprise for students. They're all having a blast in gym class this week. So, um, you know, 15 rounds of miniature golf is a lot, but kudos to them. They really, they did a great job and it's very creative and um, very, 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 very difficult because the obstacles are rubber chickens and stuffed pigs and little, you know, toys and and the kids have been very respectful i mean they have they're not messing it up either you know you could kick a barrier and it, they've they've left it exactly how it was built it's and it was really a lot of fun so that's our good news for this week thank you nicole anything you wanted to say about tech services Thank you. Katie, your special ed. I'm actually going to be pinch hitting for Katie okay. because a little bit of tech issue. So Katie wanted to share that the elementary school completed 42 annual review meetings um, last week. And she wanted to say thank you specifically to the elementary special education teachers, Mrs. Duell, Mrs. Yost, Mrs. Novak, Ms. Davidson, and Ms. Quiznell. The students are making great progress. And she wanted to say a special thank you to Tori Yost for organizing and chairing many of the meetings. 
In addition, the algebra core class with Mrs. Soldner and Mrs. Collins made a short rap video on one step equations. That video is in your um, good news. Um, one of the high school seniors wants to do a media broadcasting and one way to practice his skills is to practice reading with voice, pacing and enunciation. He visited Mrs. Hazelton's class to read a book about Abraham Lincoln. He is also reading books and uploading them to YouTube for elementary students and teachers to access. There's a picture of that in the, in the good news. And with gloves, masks, and sanitized hands, Mrs. Novak's class makes Dr. Seuss soup. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, thanks everybody. Obviously, in spite of everything, we are still persevering and doing terrific jobs at helping kids be successful. So thanks to everybody, all the staff and administrators. School services update. Leslie? Hi, everyone. Um, first thing, I have a question. We have our committee set up for the board. The one thing that's not clear um, is for the facilities committee. I know Nicole joined the committee, but we really don't have a chair that was sort of tabled. So we're gonna need someone to take on the facilities committee to take that chair role. I don't know if, I will do that. okay, thank you. Okay, um, Sleepy Hollow Lake legal fees. Um, as you know, we have a five years now of a certiary with a properties in Sleepy Hollow Lake. Um, the, the case is being seen by a new judge um, because up till now we haven't had a resolution. So it's being seen by a new judge. They're expecting that process to take probably all of next year. So there's one thing on the agenda, I'm asking the board to um, set aside money and more money in the tax tertiary reserve and that would be for any 2020 taxes that we may owe back if it doesn't go our way. But the other piece of this is the legal fees. And I've spoken to you, to the board about that um, in recent months. And the towns of Athens and the towns of Cooksacki are looking to partner up with us again to pay for those legal fees. Um, they're estimating that the fees for this defense could be anywhere from 80 to $95,000. So I'm looking for some sort of general um, feeling on the board and partnering with the towns to continue that certiary proceeding. So, so we'll yes, yes. So maybe we can, you know, we can consider that, um, but I'm going to need something so I can get back to the towns um, to let them know what our commitment level might be. So what does that look like, Leslie? Do you need to? Well, what we typically would do is an intermunicipal agreement. And then the last one we, we provided, you know, what we would be, we would be willing to pay as part of that proceeding. So that would be the conversation. What, what's the board willing to go to? A third of it would be a range of 28,000 to 32,000 for the, the school district. Great. And today we had a conversation with, with Rick Hance. He, you know, he was more of a guarantee in the lower end, which is good from our attorney. So that, again, it'd be another additional, like I think we did the last time we put a cap on it. We, right. You know, we made a resolution that we would be willing to partner with the two towns with this at, at no more than, in this case, would be 28,000 for the school district and legal fees. So. Yeah, just if you may indulge, just so again, just kind of review here. This is a, a, a suit that was filed by the Association of Property Owners of Sleepy Hollow Lake. It started in July of 2016, and they um, are asking that all their common area parcels are assessed at $0. Um, and so this has been going on. They each year continued that claim uh, going forward. Um, you know, currently uh, we have three hundred and twenty-one thousand dollars set aside in our tax tertiary reserve in case we, we eventually lose, because then we'd have to pay them back back taxes. All right. Um, if we go ahead with the, what we would be this year's taxes, we're up to four hundred and ten thousand uh, dollars that we have. We, we're, we're being responsible and putting aside in case we do lose this case. Um, you know, just as a sidebar, it's $410,000 that could go towards anything else in our schools, you know, besides this. Um, 
we've won each step of the process. As we know in New York, there's many layers of courts. I, we've, I'm including the Court of Appeals, which is a five member. It was 5-0 in our favor. Um, but Sleepy Hollow Lake Association has continued to um, press forward. Um, I think we mentioned now our, our, our legal fees are right now at $101,000. We've already spent in legal fees. Again, the money that could be spent in our classrooms. Um, if Sleepy Hollow Lake were to prevail, um, we would of course have to refund them the 410,000 out of a reserve, it would also mean a, a loss of assessed value of $4.2 million or about 0.5% on our total assessed value in the district. And so what happens then, let's say Sleepy Hollow does prevail and that money, that property is taken off the tax rolls, everybody else, including the individual homeowners in Sleepy Hollow have to pick up the difference. And so for a home in Athens, that's about $8.53 per thousand. And for a house in Kiksaki, town of Kiksaki, it's $12.27 per 100,000, I'm sorry, per 100, per 100, sorry, right. per 100,000, um, and $12.27 per 100,000 uh, for every, uh, you know, all other homeowners, every homeowner, basically, uh, in there. So I just wanted to put that out there. This is all public knowledge. I'm not hiding anything here. So, um, this is a, it's a big case, you know, certainly for us and, and the towns um, in that regard. Like I said, we've won every step of the way. You know, uh, what's happened is a, is a judge retired. I think yes. we were set to go to the next round and the judge retires. Now they bring a new judge in, they have to come here and start over. And of course, pandemic delays things, you know, right. is, I think as well uh, in that regard. So I just wanted to put that out there uh, where, where we stand. And again, um, we would certainly rather have that money going somewhere else than um, in this regard. So. Um, number three for me is uh, the Board of Ed petition, petitions. If anyone is interested in running for the Board of Ed, uh, they can contact Michelle. You can, she can send out a packet. And uh, those petitions are back with a minimum of 25 signatures by um, April 19th at 5 p.m. The bond anticipation note financing, we should have the timeline with you. Um, they'll start gathering information essentially from me around, around about April 15th, and then the process will move forward from there. But you can expect to see some action on our board agendas to, um, to take care of that, um, you know, that bond anticipation note. Um, the capital outlay project, um, there's, we are moving forward with the work on um, the Athens elevator. There's really two pieces of work. One is um, replacing some damaged parts or aged parts in the elevator. The other is the modernization. For the capital outlay, we're going to focus on the modernization piece, and then the repair is going to be taken care of out of the general fund. That way we can bring the project in under $100,000 and get the aid, 71% of that cost back in the next school year. And I think that's all I have. Any questions for me? Sorry, yes. Sorry. The almost four hundred and some thousand dollars that we have mm -hmm. sitting aside there, if we are to prevail in that, would that money have to then be spent out? You know, we can't continue to hold on to it and Correct. Account. So we would have to then spend it out. By by law, if if we were to prevail in this case. That money would have to be designated for some other purpose. It would not be able to stay in the tax or sherry reserve. That's against the law. Right. So, so you have for building project or some, it would, it would be a one year mm -hmm. loan, basically. Yes, yes. You could put it in other reserves. Yes. Yeah. So, like, so if you want to transfer it to a capital reserve account or a employee benefits reserve, you can do that, or you can put it right in the general fund and you know, and it becomes part of our, our overall budget. So there's yeah, different ways. We don't lose it. I guess a lot of money that we just have to sit on. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, take you back. It's just uh, with the 2021 20, budget and we've been, you know, I haven't done a lot with it because it's kind of hard to do it when you don't know what your revenue is going to be. Uh, we anticipate that in the next couple of weeks, even though we know there's a lot going on in Albany right now. Um, but we just wanted to share with the board, um, call this the big five. Uh, these are kind of the, the big five parts of our budget um, overall. I think it makes up about 82% of our entire budget, and that's um, transportation, uh, retirement contributions to the state retirement system, health insurance, um, salaries, which I 
I think everybody understands that, and special ed costs in general. That's both in-house and um, special ed. So it's just, this is for your information. You can kind of see a five-year trend here. Um, Leslie does it her accounting way and goes right to left. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, anyway, so it's just for your information at this point to kind of um, give you that. And, and like I said, we anticipate the next meeting that there'll, we will be all budget, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, and getting there um, in that regard. There is certainly a lot of good news coming out of Washington. Um, it's just a matter of the many filters through Albany that must travel before it gets to us. So that's what we're all, every, every school district in the state is waiting on. But it is certainly a lot better today than it was in the fall. And it certainly, you know, if you recall, and I think I mentioned this at one point, we were talk, they were talking 20% across the board cut, you know, mid-year, which was just ungodly devastating for, for us and everybody else. So that's, that's off the table. Um, it's, but it's just a matter of um, how much of that aid is earmarked for us through the, I don't even know what they call it anymore, just the CARES Act or the, the most recent stimulus bill um, is already been factored into the budget or is it all new money? We, we're trying to figure that out. Everybody's trying to figure that out, you know, uh, with that. But it's definitely, we're in a, a lot better spot and, and districts all in the state are different um, than we were six months ago. I guess leave it at that. So, um, so we'll be getting you information, you know, so we kind of have to put our, our pencils out and things like that, but I think we're hopefully a good spot. Okay, thank you. Instructional services update. It's good to follow the little budget report first because this is all contingent, obviously, on budget. Um, but we're looking to try and go back to what we had um, for summer programming back in the 1819 school year and maybe even expand on it. Um, so that would be going back to having the academic support classes that go from kindergarten up to eighth grade. Uh, where students are selected by the teachers who need just a little bit more of a push over the summer. They're hanging right in there on the cusp, but something to get them right to where they need to be for the next year. Um, and then we also had some enrichment programs that we did in the 18, 19 school year. So we would look to try and do those again, the ones that we offered last time and possibly expand them. We did have a links meeting today. So we did ask the links team for any ideas about some interesting things that we could offer the kids, something that they would find exciting. Um, and there were a lot of great uh, suggestions on how to expand some things, maybe even offer some social, social emotional type of things over the summer, as well as enrichment activities. Um, we are hopeful that we will have the kids here in person. That's the plan right now. I don't see anything happening, but I always say hopeful because you never know. Um, so we really think that that will be beneficial. And going back to, I know there's been some questions about the kids who are remote. One of the hopes is that that might possibly being that they're smaller groups that maybe we could get some of our remote kids to kind of start transitioning back into coming back in person. Um, obviously dependent on the comfort level of their parents, but I know that's gonna be a group that we're gonna target. But we're very excited about bringing kids back on campus and having another robust, um, summer of programming and as before we will have breakfast and lunch for free so um, that's going to be another wonderful opportunity for the kids to get some food and even if they don't come to our summer programs they will obviously be able to access that as well okay thank you carrie all right we have uh Program matter, superintendent's recommendations for uh, need a motion, consent for A1 and 2, approving football and girls volleyball, and the calendar. A motion? A move. Second? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No carry. Just more matters. So we have uh, quite a few retirements to cover, but this would be a motion of consent to 4B1 to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and then three other appointments, substitutes and coaches and volunteers through page eight. Have a motion and consent. So moved. 
Second. Any discussion? We no longer have a JV softball team. We have somebody, but that was brought to us late. As I said, we will wait to the next meeting to approve that person. So. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah, we plan on having a team. Yes. Okay. Yes. I know two weeks ago there was a meeting there. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, we'll talk about it. Yes. Okay. okay. Just. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and we'll we'll. we'll bring them all in but obviously you know i think you know we look here some folks who won't be with us you know who are retiring there so just to sh you know i think shout out to everybody there uh, you can see their years of service you know um you know, a lot of years uh, helping our kids and, and each other uh, as we go through so uh you know, you know colleen cole there 25 years and dave wagner 26 and eric schubert jobs 26 years and, and ms coppleston 30 years so she's not quite done yet. She'll be here till December. Um, and then Jen Lizette, you know, um, 27 years. Uh, and Darlene, 23. And a lot of people remember Darlene's a librarian for a while down at EJ Arthur, right? Yep. And she's making it happen up here in the middle school. Um, Abby Breen, our, our nurse and former board member, by the way, 15 years. And then Mr. Proper, all right, who's been with us for 23 and some different roles there. So, um, Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time right now. Uh, we'll give them their due here later on in the school year here, but just again, a very sincere thank you uh, on behalf of everybody in, in the community. So congratulations to them. Yeah, I second that. We counted 195 years. Okay, right. It was too much math for me. I'm a social studies guy, so I yeah, get the three digits, I'm done. Yeah, so <laughs> so that's a date. We'll have the chance, I guess, to speak to individuals in June. Yes, we will have them here. When I say here to a board meeting right, or, so, right, or some kind of right, event. It's yeah, like, them and the teachers, which we approved a lot of them last month. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, when does softball start then? Does it start before our, last, our next meeting? I'm going to say probably. Well, so. I just, because like Jamie just asked about the junior varsity yeah. person. If we don't, if we wait, we'll make, we'll fix, yeah, we'll okay. figure it out. I just want to make sure. Yep. No, we know. Yep. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion of consent for business. C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Separate from okay, so C one, two, four, five. Any motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carried. Motion to consent for three. C three. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any motion? So moved. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? So, so carried. Okay. Assume we don't have public input for a second time. So round the table for recognition. Nicole? Um, I, I wanted to say uh, thank you to the kids that presented today. I thought they did a great job um, and all of the staff that's involved in that. Um, I love the idea of the fundraiser and I also loved all the things that they've been doing despite the pandemic. I think it's great. So well, thanks, it's awesome. And um, this has been a really tough month personally as a teacher, just because March is just tricky. It's the end of the summer or the end of the winter. And it's just a lot of pressure on everybody that works in the school, kids, staff, whatever your role is here, I appreciate you. We appreciate you. So thanks and keep on going, Roma. <laughs> My monthly thank you to the parents. Um, I think we're doing a great job here. Our staff is incredible. I say that every month and I truly, truly mean it. 
Um, I too am in education and I too agree with um, Nicole. We did not, where I work, we did not get our February break. So it's been a long haul. Um, so thank you to our community. Or just want to recognize uh, our sports coaches for doing an incredible job getting our kids together and practicing uh, the short seasons, seasons that they've been offered this year. And and special, special recognition to all our, uh, our parents, all of our sports athletes who are behind the scenes volunteering for sports dinners and uh, helping the coaches putting things together. So I uh, want to thank them all. Sure. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's taken the time to either fill out the survey to speak at a forum or to write a letter to Michelle to share to us for the district clerk. Um, we appreciate all of your feedback and we are working through reading it all. So I just want to say thank you for you guys putting in the time to share your thoughts with us. David? Um, I just kind of wanted to echo what Nicole said and, and you know, say thank you to the the National Junior Honor Society students, you know, to be so um, well spoken, um, to put together a presentation, and not only to put together a presentation, but then to be able to deliver it virtually, which is something that, you know, as we've seen adults struggle with. Um, so it's just, again, proof that, that our kids are persevering through this, and uh, I think we all come out better in the end. Maureen? Um, I know that the faculty isn't retiring yet, but I just wanted to say thanks for hanging in for this long and, um, and good luck in your future. And it was probably, I don't know if it was an easy decision or hard decision, <laughs> but thank you for your time here and you know, making, help making our community really, really nice. I know. Um, yeah, I'll, you know, it, it's it's hard to be last because I'm going to say everything that everybody else said, but I'm so happy. Um, it was such a big decision to open up um, high risk sports. And I'm so happy with how successful we've been and we've been able to get the kids out there and get them moving and get them together and sweating and doing it safely. Um, and we're going to have a, a school performance. And I, I just appreciate all the work that has gone into making this happen in an unconventional way. So it's great. Thank you. Well, I actually just want to thank you for the board. I, being uh, president sometimes is a bit of a lightning rod for some things, but I have and I, I really appreciate the support. And when I reach out to in, you as individuals or together, you're always there with uh, great ideas. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we're going to keep going. And I think we, we really, uh, I really do enjoy the team that we've become. And I think, uh, you know, we, we work things through and we come to, help I think the administration and the teachers and everyone do what it is that we hope they can do with our kids and help them be successful and help their families uh, appreciate all the things people do. But thank you all for that. On that note, then we have future meetings. It'll be April 15th, Pre a presentation meeting here at six o'clock, April. I'm assuming we're not, we're, we'll be doing the same thing here virtually. I mean, virtually or whatever, yeah. And with the EJA library, would we go there? Yeah, okay. So we'll be, okay. And then on April 20th for the board meeting. Okay. And then May 20th for a board meeting. When is the vote? The vote. The May 18th? Okay. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, so I just need a uh, motion to go into executive session. We have to move some minutes and we have a request for executive session, I guess for a personnel issue and uh, just need a motion for that. So move. Right. Favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, so carry. So this will end this portion of our meeting. Thank you. Thank you.